I'm Dr. Alan Brown. I'm the medical director of the Midwest Heart Lipid Clinic and an interventional cardiologist with Midwest Heart Specialists. We welcome you tonight to our program on the aggressive treatment of dyslipidemia in patients with coronary artery disease. I'm proud to be presenting the uh, Acting as moderator for this program tonight, we have several very excellent speakers, and I'd like to introduce them right now. Our first speaker is Dr. Ross Simpson. Ross is professor of medicine at University of North Carolina, and he has particular expertise in preventative cardiology and cardiovascular epidemiology. He's therefore appropriately going to be speaking to us on epidemiology of coronary artery disease, as well as suggesting some inpatient clinical pathways for patients with coronary artery disease who are hospitalized. Our second speaker is Dr. Sandy Schwartz. Sandy is Professor of Medicine, Health Management, and Economics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. His primary research focus includes evaluation of medical practices as well as medical decision making and health economics. As you know, this is a very important topic in the current medical climate, and he'll be speaking to us about the clinical and economic impact of cholesterol lowering in patients with coronary artery disease, and in particular, the economic uh, impact of the 4S trial. Dr. William Roberts is our next speaker. Dr. Roberts spent 32 years as Chief of Pathology at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and he's currently Director of the Baylor Cardiovascular Institute at Baylor University Medical Center here in Dallas. He's also the Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Cardiology. And he'll be speaking to us on how low should your cholesterol be? How low is low enough for appropriate cholesterol management? Finally, I'll be presenting a summary of some of the data that's presented, as well as some suggestions regarding how to organize cholesterol management in a clinical practice. And we hope we'll give you some useful tips on how to approach your patients with dyslipidemia. Let me start by reminding you that you'll have ample time at the end of the conference to ask questions. This is an interactive teleconference, and as you've probably already been instructed, you do have boxes at the front of your sites where you'll be able to push buttons and ask us questions. We will not always be able to signal you that we can hear you so that when you go to the front of the room and push the button, if you see a green light, we will be, will be able to hear you. Uh, if we answer you when you ask, it'll cut off your audio, so please be patient. If you have the green light, go ahead and ask your question. We definitely will be able to hear you, and please don't ask, can you hear us? <laughs> Secondly, uh, please be patient when you push the button. Uh, if there's some delay because of other questions, we'd appreciate it if you wait by the box rather than going back to your seat. And if your question has been answered and you no longer have a question, simply press the button again, the call button one more time until the red light comes on, which will indicate to us that you've hung up and you have no more questions and that will help with any delays. And finally, since we have multiple sites calling in with questions, we'd appreciate it if each doctor limit is limited to one question and, and please try to keep your questions brief and to the point. And if you have a specific panelist that you'd like to direct your questions towards, feel free to do so and we'll certainly direct those questions to them. Okay, with that introduction, Dr. Simpson will go ahead and begin with your talk. Thank you, Alan. Um, my first slide is shown here and this says, um, did you call uh, to have someone come and check for margarine residue in the refrigerator? Uh, this is a tribute to my wife who's been convinced for many years now that we've been trying to poison our children with margarine instead of good wholesome butter. We don't always get the story right, but basically we're getting most of the story right now, we think, with, with some of the new information we have on aggressive management of lipids in patients with established heart disease. Now, in my presentation, what I want to do is to review some of the epidemiology of coronary artery disease and to relate this to what we see in our practices uh, in patients who, already, who are presenting to us with coronary artery disease with myocardial infarction and unstable angina. This is a uh, heart specimen, obviously, from a patient who died from a heart attack. This is a young man in his 40s who had a, uh, an infarction, probably in his late 30s, and then died as a consequence of this from um, lethal ventricular arrhythmias. What you see in the top part of, this part of the slide is some left ventricular hypertrophy. In the bottom is a myocardial infarction with extensive scarring at the, at the bottom. 
This was a myocardial infarction that was silent. Most, uh, I won't say most, but many myocardial infarctions, somewhere at least a quarter, maybe up to half of myocardial infarctions, occur without symptoms severe enough to warrant interventions. As Dr. Roberts will talk about later, this is, represents uh, a tragedy. Uh, there is the potential, at least, for aggressive preventive cardiology techniques, including aggressive lipid management, to help prevent this, this tragedy. Now, the next few slides, I'll be talking about the epidemiology of coronary artery disease. And the point I'll be making with these slides is that the disease is becoming a chronic disease. It is no longer, or longer a rapidly fatal disease as it was 20 years ago, but it's a disease that we have to live with. This is a slide from Al Tyroller uh, at the School of Public Health in the University of North Carolina. And what it shows is a breakdown of the United States by county of the incidence of death from coronary artery disease. What you see in bright yellow are those counties in the United States with the highest rates of dying from heart attacks. What you see is that the southeastern United States and portions of the northeast have very high rates of coronary artery disease. Heart attacks are not occurring randomly in this country. They are increasingly occurring in people with less economic uh, advantages and increasingly incur occurring in people uh, at lower educational levels. Because the disease is changing, is changing, we're seeing more and more people living with the disease. This is a slide that shows the prevalence of coronary artery disease. Now, the prevalence is just the number of people living with the disease at any one point in time. And this shows from about 1972 up to the 1980s, the number of people living with the disease in different regions of the country. Uh, the south is the curve on the top, the uh, Midwest, the Northeast, and the West. And what you see is the southern United States partly because of changing demography with more and more people moving to the south, or particularly older people, there are more and more people living with the disease in this part of the country. Now, Dr. Roberts um, and others, and now we'll also talk later about the relationship between serum cholesterol and heart attack risk. And to set the stage for their talks, I just wanted to point out that the risk associated with high cholesterol is much higher than is suggested by clinical trials. This is a work from Pito et al. And, it was, and Pito in 19, about 1990 suggested that because of errors in cholesterol measurement that are random errors, we tend to underestimate the heart attack disease risk from high cholesterol. The dotted line is that relationship that we all here have heard about. That just shows that for every 1% uh, change in cholesterol, you get a 1% change in the risk of having a heart attack. Pito has suggested, and I think this is now confirmed with other studies, with actual experimental data, that that relationship may be three or four to one, meaning that for every 1% change in cholesterol, you may get a three or even a 4% change in risk of heart attack. That means that a small change in cholesterol can magnify itself to a very big change in risk of heart attack. You lower your cholesterol 1%, you may lower the risk of heart disease by three or 4%. Yeah. Physicians, though, despite this very convincing data from epidemiologic studies, have not been um, overly aggressive, to say the least, about managing cholesterol. In fact, physicians have viewed this with great skepticism. This is um, a national survey done by Beth Shucker from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And what she found was in this survey that physicians found that the emphasis on high blood cholesterol was producing needless anxiety in many patients, according to the physician view. 51% of physicians felt there was too much emphasis placed on blood cholesterol in their practice. A paradox that was found in this survey, though, was most physicians, 74% of physicians, felt that this media attention was actually a help to their practice. Now, physicians um, have sort of reviewed this cholesterol story different ways. This just says here that have to run, Peter, a new client is on the way up. 
many physicians have, I think, regarded the cholesterol as a business opportunity and, and have re re regarded it with some skepticism. And this is one way to think of the problem. Another way, I think equally wrong, is shown in this slide. It says, hi, my name is Kevin, and I'll be your doctor today. Uh, neither of these models of thinking about our patients or our practices is very helpful, really. And I think physicians, because of being caught between these two poles of a practice, have really regarded cholesterol with some degree of skepticism or cholesterol management. One more slide in terms of the public health aspects of physician attitudes. This is also from Beth Shucker's work of survey data. It just shows that over the last um, 10 years, from the 1970s up to the 1990s, that more and more Americans are being screened for high cholesterol, that more and more Americans know their cholesterol level. And you can see this increasing number of the percentage of Americans who know their cholesterol level. And you can also see the increasing number of um, Americans who've been told their cholesterol level was elevated. Look at the very bottom line there. That shows the percentage of Americans who are under any treatment, including dietary treatment, for cholesterol. You can see it increases from about maybe 6 or 7 percent up to about 10 percent in 1990. Now, in 1995, there's no question that percentage is higher. However, it's not anywhere near as high as it should be. Most data now suggest that maybe 5 to 10 percent of Americans are under cholesterol management with effective drugs for high cholesterol. To understand the magnitude of the problem of high cholesterol, I'm going back now to the Lipid Research Clinic study. This is a table from the Lipid Research Clinic study telling the number, the prevalence of high cholesterol in the population. Now by prevalence here, I mean the number of people who have a cholesterol level over 240 milligrams per cent. On the top line of the table, it just shows that people between age 24 and 74, about 25% of the adult population, men and women, black and white, have a cholesterol level over 240 milligrams per cent. If you go down the column for, um, for men and for white men, what you see is for every decade as age increases, you can see a steady increase in the number of people with this high level of cholesterol. So it goes up from about 5 or 6 percent in your 20s up to about 30, 35 percent in your 60s. High cholesterol, cholesterol levels tend to increase as we get older, and the number of people who have what we consider a dangerously high level of cholesterol increases fairly rapidly as we get older. Now on the next slide, I wanted to talk about the, the patients who have heart disease, who actually present to the emergency room or to the coronary care unit with acute heart attack. And the point on this slide is to illustrate that a typical patient that you see in the emergency room with unstable angina or acute myocardial infarction has about an average cholesterol for that age patient. They do not have a very high cholesterol value. This is from the Framingham data, and it just shows the percentage of patients, the, di the distribution, in fact, of patients, cholesterol values of patients who do and do not have coronary artery disease. In the dark line, those are patients who did not have coronary artery disease. In the dotted line, you see these are patients who developed, or subjects, who developed coronary artery disease in follow-up. What you can see is these curves are very, very similar. Um, in fact, the typical patient who presents to an emergency room with acute myocardial infarction has an LDL cholesterol of about 145. That's about the same level LDL cholesterol that a similar age patient has just in the community. Um, now, this just says if you can read this, you're too close. This is the typical way we've presented preventive cardiology interventions to physicians and to patients. Well, yeah, you can stop smoking, you can lower your cholesterol, but you're going to die anyway, but please, please do that. It's good for you. It's good for somebody. Some of the newer data that Dr. Schwartz and others will present 
shows very dramatic improvements in outcomes of patients with aggressive lowering of lipids within very short time windows, within time windows of six months or less in some studies. The point here is that preventive cardiology is not something that has a long-term payback. It can have a very short-term payback in patients with known heart disease. Now, my last two slides are really just to illustrate some practical ideas of what to do about this. This is taken from a, a presentation I gave at the American Heart Association several years ago, and it, it was designed to show how to integrate preventive cardiology into your practice and to give some practical ideas to people about how to improve lipid management in patients who are presenting to the hospital with unstable angina or acute myocardial infarction. I think the key element on this is to have a cholesterol management protocol as part of your management of all patients of presenting with acute unstable angina syndromes or acute infarction. And I think the key to this is screening. What, it said, what I'm saying is that a patient presenting with an acute myocardial infarction or unstable angina should have a total cholesterol measured at the time of the first creatinine phosphokinase measurement. This level is reasonably accurate and will give you a reasonably good idea of what the patient's typical cholesterol is. I think it's important to set goals, but in reality, what you're talking about here is lowering a cholesterol that's a, an LDL cholesterol that's about 145, 145 down to a level of about 100. And I feel that therapy including diet counseling should be done in the hospital. We also feel that drug therapy in these patients should be initiated in the hospital. It's sending a bad message to patients to send them home without starting effective treatment for the problem that really brought them into the hospital in the first place. Now this really is my last slide. I lied about the others. Um, this just says this is nothing. When I was your age, the snow was so deep it came up to my chin. I show this slide to really give credit to make sure everyone realize what we're doing. We have made a tremendous advances and achievements in lowering the population's level of cholesterol. We've even made, done good work as physicians in our own practices. We have further to go yet. We must continue to lower cholesterol, and right now the data is so overwhelming that we feel very strongly that aggressive lipid management should be initiated rapidly in patients who present with unstable angina or acute infarction. Thank you. Thanks very much, Russ. Uh, you know, this talk of yours brings up a question that I frequently get asked when I'm giving talks, which is at what age should you begin screening for dyslipidemia? And I wonder if you could comment, is there an age where you should, everybody should be screened, or what would be the approach, or is there an age where it's too young? What would be your recommendations? Well, thank you. The, the National Cholesterol Education Program has recommended all adults over age 21 have their cholesterol screened. I think it's also critical any patient presenting with chest pain or unstable angina also have their cholesterol screened promptly. Now the question that does come up where there is an agreement nationally has to do with children, people under age 21. Um, the National Cholesterol Education Program does not recommend general screening in children. Now that's not a recommendation I personally agree with, but I think we should endorse that. The reason they recommend screening only if risk factors, particularly if family history, are present. Um, and I think it's something we should endorse and follow. Um, the one problem I have with that personally is that it tends to miss children. Children who have risk factors for heart disease don't get screened and there is a danger you'll miss some, some children who are at very high risk for heart disease without doing systematic screening. Yes, I think we probably all agree that the, the biggest danger would be to miss a child who has familial hypercholesterolemia and uh, those children will have high lipids at birth. So that the tip-off would be a very strong family history of premature coronary disease. And I think if you have a family like that with multiple relatives in the 30s and 40s with coronary disease, you should suspect this very high-risk genetic diagnosis, and you should be able to pick that up in children rather early. And it's generally accepted that under 170 milligrams per deciliter would be the normal for children rather than the 
magic number of 200 we use for adults. Thank you very much. Our next talk is Dr. Schwartz. Sandy? Yes, uh, there are three things that I want to do tonight. The first is talk a little bit about the economic environment in which we're all practicing. And second, then talk a little bit about health economics and the principles of health economics and how that might help us better adapt to this environment, allowing us to continue to provide high quality care to our patients in what's an increasingly cost-constrained environment. And then I want to go from there and show how the 4S data will fits in with this and how we can use the information to make cost-effective decisions about managing patients with high cholesterol. Now, the, the reason that we're here to talk about health care is shown on this first slide. As recently as 1950 in the United States, we were only spending $20 billion a year on health care. But now, in 1995, we will reach a trillion dollars. And as one looks at the slide, one gets the sense that things are escalating out of control. Now, now it's been said that there are three types of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. And you always have to be careful when you look at any sorts of figures, particularly about health care. The next slide shows what's happened to health care costs in the United States, as in the previous slide. But in this slide, the figures have been adjusted for the increase in the growth of the economy. And what you see here is that, in contrast to the previous slide, the rate increase in health care costs has been remarkably steady over the last four decades. In fact, health care costs have been increasing at a rate of one and a half to two times the rate of inflation and the rate and the general growth of the economy compounded annually for each of the last 45 years. Now, what is driving? Now, this may seem like a uniquely American problem. In uh, 1995, we will spend about 14% of our gross national product on health care, much more than other countries which are industrialized. But as you see on this slide, compared to other countries, when you look at these figures in inflation-adjusted, population-adjusted way, the United States is not an outlier. And the important point I want you to take away from this slide is that the problem of health care costs increasing faster than societies can sustain them is a universal problem in the developed, industrially developed world. It is not just an American problem. And the reason for this becomes clear when one looks at what's driving health care costs inflation. This slide shows some of the common reasons that are often offered for, for accounting for health care cost inflation. And the most common reason that we hear from politicians and the general public is waste, greed, and abuse. Hospitals are wasteful, doctors are greedy, pharmaceutical companies, device manufacturers, insurers are wasteful and greedy. And all we have to do is pay everybody a little less, and that will solve our problem. However, the life isn't so simple. Economists who have studied this very carefully have estimated that the most we can save in terms of improved efficiency in the current system is in the range of 5 to 7 percent. Now, 5 to 7 percent of a billion dollars is a lot of money. Everett Dirksen, a former senator from Illinois, once said, a billion here, a billion there, and soon you're talking about real dollars. And 50 to 70 billion dollars is enough money to provide health care to all the uninsured Americans. So we're talking about a substantial amount of money. And, and efficiency and waste should be, inefficiency and waste should be sought out and, and removed from the system wherever possible. However, we have to keep it in perspective. We are not going to be able to solve the problems of healthcare inflation by getting rid of inefficiency. That's not what's driving the system. If healthcare costs were increasing at the rate of one and a half to two times that of inflation due to inefficiency, we wouldn't be talking about economics today because we could all easily decide what we needed to cut from the system. About 70% of what we would do would be clearly wasteful and we wouldn't have to make the tough decisions we all have to make every day. Well, what about population growth and aging? Over the last 45 years, the population of the United States has grown, and it is also much older. But uh, except for the Medicare program, this is not an important factor. Overall, in the country, population demographic changes only account for 1 or 2 percent of increased health care costs. Defensive medicine is a similar story. While defensive medicine may have played an important role in healthcare cost inflation for very brief periods of time at the end of the 70s and end of the 80s, 
it really has not been a major factor in healthcare cost inflation. In fact, the estimates of what defensive medicine um, cost in this country have remained constant at around five to seven percent of the healthcare dollar for a long period of time. Now, general inflation accounts for about half of the increase, and then there's another 25 percent that is due to increased service intensity. An increased service intensity has two components. One is technological innovation. I'm a general internist who graduated medical school 21 years ago in 1974. I can't think of a single condition that I both diagnose and treat the same way today as I did when I graduated medical school. In each case, I can take better care of my patients. And in almost every case, it's more expensive to do so. And technological innovation and the problems of t in terms of cost caused by technological innovations because over the last 20 to 30 years, we've made substantial investments through the public sector, primarily through NIH, and through the private sector, primarily through the pharmaceutical industry and also the medical device industry. And these investments in research, in basic and applied research, are bearing fruit. And we will have uh, many new technologies which are coming to market, coming to, that we will be able to use to improve patient care over the next 10 years, to the next 15 years, but many of them will be cost increasing. Secondly, second part of service intensity has to do with patient demand. Contrary to what most of us think, the average American has better health insurance today than they did 40, 45 years ago. 40 years ago, there was no Medicare and the poor, the elderly were largely uninsured. There was no Medicaid and the poor were uninsured. Today, in addition to having more people covered by insurance, the type of insurance that we have has changed. We've gone from a, a catastrophic type of insurance to a lot of first dollar coverage. And this has been encouraged by the tax system, which subsidizes health care costs to the extent that health insurance is tax deductible or tax free as it is provided by a fringe benefit. So whenever you subsidize a good, people tend to use more of it because it tends to, we see it as costing us less. In addition to having better insurance and therefore having more demand for health care, the average American today is much better informed about what their options are under health care. And we all have patients who read the newspaper, like today's newspaper, today's local paper or New York Times or Wall Street Journal, read about what's coming out of the medical journals and come to us wanting certain services. As a general internist, I rarely see a patient with a headache, but I see many patients with headaches who need MRI scans according to their own needs. I rarely see a patient who just twists their knee, but I have lots of patients who come in and feel that they need arthroscopy. And this is a problem that we've all um, learned to deal with. Now, the American College of Surgeons noted almost 80 years ago that all of us are accountable to the public for our degree of success, and that if the medical profession doesn't take the initiative, then it will be taken by the lay public. And that is precisely what's happening in the United States today. This slide is a conceptual model of what is happening to the healthcare environment that we all operate in today. And what it shows is, is that about 10 years ago, all of this country virtually was in an unstructured healthcare market, which is referred on the slide to stage one. And an unstructured healthcare market is characterized by independent hospitals independent physicians, and unsophisticated purchasers, what we might call the good old days. But as healthcare costs continued to increase, there was the HMOs were developed, in large part to try to attempt to control healthcare costs. And with the growth of HMOs, we found that we had excess inpatient capacity. It's still controversial how much HMOs save money, and it's more controversial how they save money, but two things are clear. They reduce costs by paying providers less, paying doctors and hospitals less for the services we provide, and also they have encouraged and facilitated a shift of pay services from the hospital to the outpatient environment. These changes are sufficient to put hospitals and physicians under price pressure and cause us to form loose associations with one another.
These changes then are further consolidated as healthcare costs generally continue to increase. Because what happens in stage two is while we form affiliations and associations with each other and hospitals merged with each other, we don't make the difficult decisions about trying to consolidate services. So what characterizes a stage three market is this increased consolidation where there is increased capitation of group practices, hospital margins erode, and hospitals make the tough decisions about where to regionalize or centralize services, and specialist revenue tends to decline, particularly the income of procedure-oriented specialists. And if we get to stage four, and there are only a few areas of the country that might be considered managed competition areas, areas like Minneapolis, you have a few large providers representing tens of thousands of patients and they're negotiating insurance for those patients with just a few large integrated cradle-to-grave services, service providers. Now, this is not a uniform process. This slide shows that the red areas, which are stage three and stage four areas, and these are largely in the West Coast, Minneapolis, I mean Minnesota, Wisconsin, Eastern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Eastern Maryland. Stage two areas are largely confined to the north central states and Florida and a couple of scattered western states and stage, much of the country, the heartland of the United States, much of the south and the midwest and the mountain states are still in stage one. To succeed in this environment, one has to learn how to limit cost increasing technological change. And the question is how do you do that? I learned about this from my son Adam seven years ago. Adam's now 12, but seven years ago he was five years old, decided to go into business one hot, humid summer day outside of Philadelphia where we lived, and he opened a lemonade stand. And he had his sister Sarah make him a sign that said, lemonade, all you can drink, a dollar. I explained to him that adults would not spend a dollar on a two, three ounce glass of lemonade, and he told me that not everybody was as cheap as I was. So I thought I'd let him learn the hard way about how hard it was to go into business. And I sat there and watched them, and the we live on a quiet street where a lot of people engage in recreational activities on weekends, and the first 35 or 40 people who drove by, walked by, rode their bikes by, rollerbladed by, every single one of them stopped and gave them a dollar. So after a while, I was very thirsty, it was hot and humid, and I didn't want him to think I was as cheap as he clearly thought I was. So I went into the house to get money, I got a dollar out of his bank and came back down, bought myself a glass of lemonade, but it was really one of these little paper Dixie cups the kids used to brush their teeth that had almost no lemonade in it. So I poured myself another glass, went to drink it, and he grabbed it out of my hands. And I asked Adam why he was doing that when his sign said, lemonade, all you can drink. And without blinking an eye, he said, I said that's all you can drink. And that is indeed what we're facing in the healthcare environment today. A lot of what is called managed care is really managing finances. It tells us this is how much money you have, you figure out what to do with it. Now the first response many of us have in, this, to, in response to this is shown in this slide. This says our anorexia clinic and fat suction clinic have merged into the new fat exchange clearinghouse. What happens is we try to get more efficient, get rid of that extra secretary or cut down the min time we spend with a patient by a minute or two, reduce the paperwork. And while this is good to some degree, all it does is buy us time. And there is a better way which we need to address to make decisions, and that's summarized on this slide. When I graduated medical school 21 years ago, things were easy. We made decisions about medical interventions just based on their safety and efficacy. Were the side effects acceptable? and did the intervention work under ideal clinical and scientific conditions. And while these two criteria of safety and efficacy are still important, they are necessary but no longer sufficient. In addition to safety and efficacy, we're increasingly being forced to ask not only are the side effects acceptable and can the intervention work, but does it work in my practice environment? And if it does, is it worth doing? Does it provide sufficient value to warrant being done. And this is what ec where economics makes a contribution. The types of economic questions that we ask are, are, and that you will see in medical literature, are cost effectiveness studies. And in cost effectiveness studies, we look at both the cost of an intervention and the benefit of an intervention. The costs are measured in terms of dollars. The benefits are expressed in natural units like mortality or survival, complications, and quality of life and functional status.
So the types of information that we read about are measured, the, the economics are measured in terms of how much does it cost to save a year of a person's life, or even better, how much does it cost to save a quality adjusted year of life, which is merely the enhanced survival one gets from a superior intervention weighted by the quality of that enhanced survival. Now, a couple caveats here. One is that um, for interventions to be cost-saving, effective, they do not have to be cost-saving. This is one of the more common errors that people make in, with economics. And that's illustrated on the next slide. Here we see the cost per year of life save for some common medical interventions. And I want to make just three points with this slide. Don't pay attention too much to the details. I want you, want you to understand the three things. First of all, contrary to what happens when we read a medical journal, there is not a single cost per year of life save for any medical intervention. In fact, there are, are, is a wide range of cost per year of life save for any intervention. And the reason for that is medical interventions are ne neither good nor bad, and it's not that they either work or don't work. Most of the things we use in practice, it's a question of how well they work in what patients under what conditions. The second thing I want to emphasize is that while in this country we don't have any explicit criteria for what we consider cost effective, implicitly we do. When you look at interventions that we all accept doing, they invariably have cost per year of life saves between less than fifty to sixty thousand dollars, fifty to seventy thousand dollars per year of life saved. When we look at interventions that we say are too expensive to do, the cost per year of life saved is usually above a hundred, a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. And the things we argue about fall in between. So consider the case of screening mammography. Everybody in this country agrees that we should be doing screening mammography on women who are above the age of fifty every year or every other year. What's the cost per year of life saved? $40,000. But there is a debate about whether we should be doing screening mammography on 40 to 50 year old women who are at low risk and asymptomatic. It isn't that the mammograms will not pick up additional cases earlier. It's just that the prevalence of disease and the incidence of disease are lower in 40 year olds than in 50 year olds, so there are fewer cases to detect. And the test is not as, has more, uh, is not as sensitive in 40-year-old women because their breasts tend to have more fibrous tissue and therefore uh, the test doesn't pick up early lesions as well. So the cost per year of life saved for 40-year-old women exceeds $120,000 per year of life saved. And we'll get back to where some of these other interventions fall in um, at the end. How does this all relate to cholesterol lowering? Well, last year in The Lancet, an excellent article was published called the Scandinavian Simvastatin Survival Study, often referred to as 4S. And the rationale behind 4S is summarized on this slide. Prior to the conduct of 4S, there was very good epidemiologic evidence that indicated that there was a correlation between survival and cholesterol level. And there had been previously conducted randomized trials that showed that if you lowered somebody's cholesterol, you would reduce the rate of heart disease and death from heart disease. But none of those studies had shown that there was also an improvement in overall survival. So the objective of the 4S was to investigate whether long-term simvastatin therapy reduced total mortality as well as coronary events. And this study was conducted in post-MI in angina patients who had serum cholesterol levels between 212 and 309 milligrams per deciliter. As shown in this slide, the design was a double-blinded, randomized placebo-controlled trial conducted in 94 centers in five countries. 4,444 men and women were randomized who had prior myocardial infarction at least six months before the study began, or before they were entered into the study, or who had angina and who had cholesterol levels in the range shown here were randomized to either diet or diet plus simvastatin. And the simvastatin was titrated to either 20 milligrams a day or 40 milligrams a day depending on the cholesterol level low that was achieved, the LDL level. As you can see on this slide, the baseline characteristics, sociodemographic as well as clinical, were very similar between the two groups. There were no important significant differences. 
And the trial showed not only a 42% reduction in coronary, coronary mortality in the patients treated with simvastatin, but also showed a 34% reduction in major coronary events and a 30% improvement in overall survival. So clinically, it, it, it showed in a very convincing fashion that there was an improvement in both cardiovascular mortality, cardiovascular morbidity, and overall mortality in patients given simvastatin therapy. Well, what about the economics? Was this, is, it, is it worth doing, or does it cost too much to achieve this benefit? The 4S also looked at the utilization of resources for, for coronary disease. And as shown in this slide, there was a 37% reduction in the need for revascularization in patients who receive simvastatin as opposed to placebo. Now what we have done at the University of Pennsylvania is take the reductions in the use of hospital services and other services such as revascularization that was observed in simvastatin and estimated what would this cost if we translated these results to the United States. And as shown on this slide, what you see is in the third column, number decreased, the number of cases of hospitalization or procedures that were reduced by simvastatin. And the second column shows the cost in terms of DRG dollars using a, a national data set provided by MedStat, which has a national data set of several hundred hospitals. And then we multiplied the two together and we found that if we got the same results in the United States that were observed in 4S, we would reduce hospital costs and procedure costs for these patients by $8 million over the five-year course of the study. Now, the drug is not free. Giving drug to 2,222 patients who benefited with, and provided this $8 million savings would have cost $11.6 million. So there is a net cost overall of providing therapy of $3.5 million. How does one decide whether this $3.5 million is worth spending or not? We know we get improved benefit, but at what cost? And this is where the health economics comes in. It's relatively simple to estimate or calculate the incremental cost effectiveness of simvastatin therapy compared to placebo. What you see on this slide is how you do that. You take the cost of treating patients with simvastatin, subtract from that the cost of patients incurred who receive placebo, divide that by the differences in benefit. And when one does this for the 2,222 patients who were in the trial, one sees that it cost $11.6 million over the five-year course of the trial to treat the treatment group with simvastatin, and one, but the placebo group incurred a little more than $8 million in additional hospital costs, and 74 lives were saved for this difference in cost or for a difference of approximately three and a half million dollars, 74 lives were saved. Simple division yields that the cost per life saved is $48,000. Now remember before I said that implicitly in this country, it appears that if interventions cost less than 50 to $70,000 per year of life saved, we accept them as good medical care. In this particular case, we're spending less than $50,000 not to save a year of a person's life, but to save their life. And the question then comes, how long do these people live after they've had their heart attack avoided? We don't yet know the answer to that. We're continuing to do work in that area. But the most conservative estimate that one could take is that everybody in the trial died the day the trial ended. That is, all of the benefit that the simvastatin patients received disappeared the day the trial ended. In that particular case, in 4S, the treatment group patients lived on average two more years than the placebo group. So if we divide 48,000 by two, we find that it costs about $24,000 per year of life saved. And that is the most conservative estimate that one can come up with. A more realistic estimate based on continuing where work we're doing suggests that the cost per year of life saved will be somewhere between five and $12,000. And this ranking it among the most cost effective things that we do as physicians. For example, that's about the cost effectiveness of doing coronary bypass surgery in people with left main or proximal LAD three vessel disease with low ejection fractions.
So in this slide, this cartoon summarizes sort of what 4S has done for us. The doctor is saying, I have some good news for you. While your cholesterol level has remained the same, the research findings have changed. And I think what 4S demonstrates is that lowering cholesterol will now is not only good medicine, but it's also good economics. It's clear on the basis of 4S, as well as a wide variety of epidemiologic and studies and other randomized trials that were done, that cholesterol reduction is clinically effective. It reduces coronary disease, death from coronary disease, and improves survival. And in the patients that were included in 4S, people with established coronary disease and elevated cholesterol levels, cholesterol reduction is extremely cost effective. I think the, the challenges facing us now are not whether to treat patients, but how to improve and increase the number of treatments, patients that we treat. Several studies have indicated that only 20 to 25 percent of patients who are eligible for cholesterol lowering, only 20 to 25 percent of patients who have established heart disease and elevated cholesterol levels are being treated. Therefore, the major challenge facing us today is how do we increase the identification and treatment of patients with established coronary heart disease and high cholesterol. Alan? Thank you very much, Sandy. Your talk uh, brings to mind a, a talk that I heard recently that had an impact on me, which was a, a discussion of the proposed health care reform plan. And I remember the speaker was showing a graph of the health care reform, which showed the government quality assurance organizations and the local insurance uh, bureaus. And then looking down in a very small box in this huge graph on the slide, down in the little corner, it said health care providers. And that was supposed to be us. And he went on to show a picture of a physician from the 1940s, obviously. It was a black and white picture, very distinguished looking fellow with a bow tie and a long white coat in the hospital holding hands with a patient and talking to the patient and he pointed out that this physician was explaining the risk versus benefits of therapy to the patient, potential side effects and generally counseling the patient. <coughs> Excuse me. And he added that this physician was his father and he said my father was not a health care provider. My father was a doctor. And the implication was that being a doctor is something more than being a health care provider and that we need to retain the special things about a physician, which is to look at individual patients and determine what's in their best interest. Now, you've just presented eloquently the importance of economics in healthcare. And what I'd like to do is with that little introduction, how do we rectify as physicians the importance of remaining a patient advocate and remaining a caring, compassionate diagnostician who deals with an individual patient with all the pressures that we're currently under to be aware of the economic data? Well, that's a tough question. I think we have to do a couple things. One is we, have to, we can't ignore reality, and we can't continue to practice as if cost were not a factor. I would argue that there isn't a physician who's watching this or participating tonight who has not made a decision in the past week based on cost. If we ever had a patient who we thought might have an MI but almost certainly doesn't and didn't put them in the intensive care unit, that's a decision based on cost. When we take a person who we think has a urinary tract infection and we don't use the most expensive, most effective drug because we're using a drug that's much less expensive and virtually as good, that's a decision based on cost. So we can't ignore cost. But we do have to pay, remember that our role is not to ensure the financial viability and profitability of our hospitals and the insurance companies with which we deal, but our role is at patient advocates. And I think this is where economics can actually help us instead of being a problem. Uh, the first thing is, is to recognize that a lot of people talk about economics, very few people understand it. You cannot go wrong underestimating the understanding of economics and cost that most healthcare administrators have. So they often misinterpret the data, and the most common misinterpretation is confusing cost effective with cost saving. The second thing that we need to bring to the table is the need to individualize this information. I showed the cost per year of life save for different interventions. And it is different for every patient within that range, and we need to be aware of that. There was a story in the Wall Street Journal about 10 years ago about a man who was in a hot air balloon and landed in the middle of an empty field, didn't know where he was. And a woman was walking by and he said, excuse me, ma'am, can you tell me where I am? 
And she said, yes, you're standing in the gondola of a hot air balloon in the middle of an empty field. <laughs> and he, sa she, he said, well, you must be a health economist. <laughs> and she said, yes, how do you know? He said, because the information you gave me is precise and accurate, but of totally no value to me. And I, I think in certain ways, if, if we just pay attention to the numbers and we don't recognize that those, what those numbers are good for and what their limitations are, we can be led astray. I think the message people should take home from the economics is that if we don't have enough resources to treat all patients with all conditions, and we don't, then we have to make decisions about what care to provide and what care not to provide. And economics can help us order those decisions. They can say, if you have to cut something, cut this procedure or this service because it provides very little benefit. On the other hand, it don't cut these other things because these things are worth it. And I think tying that in with the individual patient preferences is the challenge that we face as physicians. And that's why they pay us the big bucks. I'm going to follow that up with one very brief question, and that is, does health care have to be cost-saving? No, absolutely not. Even my uh, daughter, Julie, who, when she was 12 years old, pointed out to me that we don't spend a trillion dollars a year saving money. Um, nobody goes to their doctor to save money, and we shouldn't. What people do expect from a doctor is that we're going to help them make decisions uh, that are reasonably uh, worthwhile. And uh, we need to serve this, uh, pr provide that role a little bit better than we have in the past. But I think it's unreasonable to expect healthcare to save money. And that's something we have to work very hard with our professional societies to de in dealing with policymakers, both at our local levels as well as the national level. Thank you very much, Sandy. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. William Roberts, who's going to talk to us about how low should your cholesterol be and how low is low enough. Bill? Thank you, Alan. What we see here is a coronary artery, which is terribly narrowed. If you just look at that person next to you, one of you are going to die with a coronary artery, which looks like this. Now, I know it's a person next to you, uh, not you, but this is the major uh, problem in the Western world as far as cause of death or potential cause of death. Let me spend a couple of moments here talking about how extensive this process is, at least in the coronary arteries, in patients for a moment with fatal coronary disease. If we add up the lengths of the right coronary artery, that's about 10 centimeters, and the left anterior descending is about 10, and the left circumflex is about 6, and the left main is about 1, we're dealing with about 27 centimeters of major coronary artery in each of us. And in patients with fatal coronary disease, irrespective of the subset, uh, whether it's acute myocardial infarction, sudden death outside the hospital, unstable angina, chronic congestive heart failure, um, uh, uh, after healing of myocardial infarction, the average five millimeter segment of this length of the coronary arteries is narrowed about 67%. And not just one of these five millimeter segments, but the entire coronary tree has plaque in it in each five millimeter segment. But the average for each segment is about 67% of the lumen in cross-sectional area is obliterated by plaque. And about a third of the lengths of these arteries in each of the coronary subsets is narrowed over 75% in cross-sectional area. The point here is by the time we die from this process, it is, it's extensive and severe. Next. Now what do these plaques consist of? Uh, shown in this uh, slide are the various components of atherosclerotic plaques in patients with fatal coronary disease, uh, all of these individuals were over 40 years of age. Now the bar on the left shows the little plaques. These are plaques that narrow the lumen 25% or less, and the bar on the right uh, shows the composition of the plaques which, which were so large that they occluded the lumen or virtually occluded the lumen. 
Now the yellow represents dense or acellular fibrous tissue and the red represents cellular fibrous tissue. So we can see all of these plaques, whether they're little or whether they're big, the dominant component in these plaques is fibrous tissue. Now these are not plaques in 10-year-old children or 20-year-old young men. These are plaques in patients with fatal coronary disease. Calcium is shown in blue, that's relatively small. Green represents extracellular lipid. And foam cells, at least in patients over 40 years of age, represents a very small component of the plaques. So, in patients with fatal coronary disease, these plaques consist primarily of fibrous tissue, scar tissue. Let me spend a moment on primary prevention. Uh, as we've already heard, it pays to lower cholesterol, be it after a heart attack or before a heart attack. The two uh, uh, primary prevention studies in the 1980s uh, used uh, cholestyramine and gemfibrozil. A third one will be reported in November at the American Heart Association meeting, and that third study will use a statin drug. But these first two studies, using drugs which are not as nearly as powerful as the statin drug, show that if you compare patients who actually took the drug to those who did not, that for every 1% drop in total cholesterol, there was a 3% drop in heart attack frequency. For example, if, if the total cholesterol falls by 10%, let's say from 200 to 180, the heart attack rate drops 30%. On the other hand, if our total cholesterol goes up 10%, let's say from 180 to 200, our heart attack frequency goes up 30%. Now to uh, treatment of patients who have had atherosclerotic events, so-called secondary prevention. Now what we see here are 14 angiographic trials in patients who had already had coronary events. The red bars uh, represent uh, the patients who were treated with a cholesterol-lowering cholesterol regime in each of these trials. That regime may be a pure vegetarian diet. It may be a partial ileal bypass operation, which significantly lowers cholesterol. Or it may be one or more uh, uh, cholesterol-lowering drugs. And what we see in every one of these trials, that there was less progression during the baseline angiogram and the subsequent angiogram, which was anywhere from one year, two years, two and a half, or four years after the baseline angiogram. Every single one of the trials showed that in the treatment group, there was less progression, less growth of that plaque during the one to four year period. Furthermore, there was evidence of regression or plaque shrinkage in all but the first of these 14 angiographic trials. Again, the treatment group is shown in red. And every one of the trials show that in the patients treated with the lipid-lowering regime, there was much greater evidence of regression of plaque in the treatment group compared to the non-treatment group. Now, how does this regression come about? Well, we know that if a person has a atheros an atherosclerotic event, be it in any of our arterial systems, that that patient has at least one and usually more of the arteries narrowed greater than 75% in cross-sectional area. Now, I'm talking about the unit cross-sectional area, not diameter reduction, which is the unit of angiography. So in order to have an event, we have to have one or more arteries narrowed greater than 75% in cross-sectional area. And on the average, about 10% of that plaque contains lipid material. Now, if we lower our cholesterol level from up here all the way down to the 150 level for total or under 100 for the LDL, some of that lipid material may be removed from the plaque and we can open up the lumen so that it, it is now less than 75% narrowed, which would be as if there was no plaque at all from the standpoint of flow. In other words, relatively small changes 
in plaque mass lead to very significant increases in lumen size. Now even more important than whether plaques uh, uh, re regress or the growth is uh, enormously slowed is whether or not patients who've had one heart attack have a lower frequency of subsequent heart attacks. And what we see here are the clinical event uh, decreases in, in 12 of these 14 angiographic trials. Um, and what we see, the stars for example there, the reduction in clinical events in the patients treated with lipid lowering compared to the placebo group was reduced 90%. In the FATS trial, it was a reduction of 60%. In the POSH trial, uh, no, 80%. In the POSH trial, it was 60%. Now, we all know that aspirin decreases the chance of a subsequent coronary event after the initial event by about 25%. Beta blockers reduce subsequent events by about 25%. And here we see lipid-lowering drugs have the potential of reducing subsequent events by up to 90%. Now we've heard from Dr. Swartz a good deal about the 4S study. There is no question this is the best of the secondary prevention trials. It went on 4.5 years. In, in this country, this trial may have been stopped uh, at the end of three years because the results were so good. Uh, overall uh, uh, risk of death, as we've heard, decreased 30%. The risk of coronary death decreased 42%. And all of these reductions were highly significant. What we see on the right are the p-values for, for these. Coronary mortality p-value 0. 0.00001. Uh, major coronary events, uh, need for, for angioplasty or bypass, and event-free survival. All the p-values in those were the same. Enormously significant. Now, who should be treated with cholesterol-lowering drugs? I'm not talking about who should be treated with cholesterol-lowering uh, uh, diets. We all should be on, on less saturated fat, uh, uh, less cholesterol, uh, and less calories. So I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about who should be treated with drugs. Now, shown in this slide are the recommendation of the adult treatment panel number two of the cholesterol education program. And what we see on the LDL uh, numbers on the left, if a person has an LDL of greater than 190 and no uh, other additional risk factors and no established atherosclerosis, that's the number to treat. And the goal is to get that LDL to less than 160. If on the other hand a person has an LDL of greater than 160 but less than 190 and has two or more additional risk factors, 160 is the number to begin treatment. And if a patient has established atherosclerosis, a coronary event like acute myocardial infarction, unstable angina or whatever, the magical number is 130 with the goal of getting that number to under 100. Now my point of showing all this, if it is good to get the LDL to less than 100 after an atherosclerotic event, Surely it would be useful to get that LDL number to less than 100 before an atherosclerotic event. So all of these numbers, as far as I'm concerned, uh, should be lower. Now these are the six uh, atherosclerotic risk factors uh, other than uh, cholesterol, and this will be uh, discussed by Dr. Brown in a, in a few minutes. Now these are the cholesterol lowering uh, or altering drugs that are presently available. Uh, I'm a statin uh, person. Um, uh, the statin drugs are really the only once a day drugs. They are by far the best of the LDL lowering drugs, but they also had, have very favorable effects on HDL. They also lower triglyceride uh, as well, and they have very favorable effect on triglyceride. 
The only other drug that has this potential is nicotinic acid, but as we all know, uh, it has certain problems. Uh, a, a lot of people don't like it. I, I don't particularly like it. I, I tried it to see what it was uh, uh, like. Uh, we have to take that drug more than uh, uh, once a day. Uh, the push uh, now, uh, after the 4S study, is to increase the dose of statin drug that the patient is on. Now shown here uh, are the results of, of trying to get that LDL to less than 100 by Zocor or Simvastatin. Now in the bar on the left, the patient started with an LDL of 145. And as Dr. Simpson said, this is the average LDL cholesterol level in the typical patient coming into the hospital with acute myocardial infarction. Now the light blue is, is only five milligrams of simvastatin, and only about 50% of the patients reached gold uh, with, with that dose. With 10 milligrams of simvastatin, a higher percent, but it took 20 milligrams for most of the patients uh, to reach uh, goal. If on the right bar there, one starts with an LDL of 165, uh, in most patients, it's going, in a lot of patients at least, it, one has to go all the way to 40 milligrams in order to reach goal. And now the cost of uh, 20 milligrams of Zocor or Simvastatin is essentially the same except for one dollar per month difference uh, as the higher dose, 40 milligrams. The point I want to make on this slide is shown on the bottom line, that is total events. Now as we all know, Simvastatin group did much better over this 5.4 years than did the placebo group. The evidence is overwhelming that if you have a heart attack or unstable angina, or, uh, that one should be on a cholesterol lowering drug. But if you look at the bottom line there, the total events, the total events during this 5.5 uh, years in the simvastatin group was over 1,000, 1,049, and in the placebo group, it was a third higher, nearly uh, 1,500. The point here is that as good as simvastatin was after the heart attack, and don't forget that these patients didn't start the lipid-lowering drug until six months after the heart attack. And in most countries, 20% of people die during acute myocardial infarction. 80% of the people in the 4S study had had an acute myocardial infarction. And then about 5% of most studies show that the people, people die uh, during the six months after the infarction. So about 25% of the people died before uh, they would have been eligible for this study. But despite its, the wonderful effects of simvastatin, Still, there were very high percent of individuals who had subsequent coronary events uh, during that 5.4 years. Therefore, as good as it is to start treating patients who have greater than 75% cross-sectional area narrowing of one or more coronary arteries or arteries in anywhere in the body, it would be much better if we could start treating patients whose arteries were narrowed between 51 and 75 percent in cross-sectional area. Yes, they have plaque, but at that degree of narrowing, there is no diminution of blood flow. Now, that is a great challenge. How do we start treating people whose arteries are narrowed between 51 and 75 percent? And I would consider that the biggest treatment challenge um, of the next few years. Now, atherosclerotic plaques are not limited to coronary arteries. They occur in virtually all of our arteries, uh, save, let's say, the mammary artery. What about when we see that calcium knob on a chest x-ray in the aorta? Should that patient be treated? What about abdominal aortic aneurysm? What about asymptomatic carotid artery disease? What about the person with intestinal angina or peripheral vascular disease? Here's a, a typical abdominal aortic aneurysm. That is due to a combination of atherosclerosis and hypertension in my view. I think that person ought to be on a lipid lowering drug. Uh, the ACAP study showed very nicely that patients with asymptomatic carotid artery progression should be on a cholesterol lowering drug.
What about the patient who has calcium in the mitral annulus, calcium in the aortic valve, also calcium in the coronary arteries, which virtually 100% of these patients do? I consider the elderly patients with these lesions uh, to be the result of atherosclerosis, and I think they should be on cholesterol-lowering drugs. Uh, let me summarize uh, by a couple of statements here. By the time atherosclerotic disease is diagnosed clinically, the process is extensive and diffuse. The first clinical manifestation of coronary atherosclerosis is the last in about 25% of patients because the first manifestation is fatal. Even though lipid-lowering therapy after an atherosclerotic event is of proven benefit, the frequency of recurrent events is high and the process is usually fatal. Preventing coronary events would eliminate 90% of patients with chronic congestive heart failure and 90% of cases of malignant ventricular arrhythmias. And finally, in my view, the emphasis needs to change from decreasing risk of atherosclerotic events to preventing and arresting atherosclerosis. And unless we are willing to be pure vegetarians, that requires more lipid-lowering drug therapy administered earlier and in higher doses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. I've often heard it said that you can never be skinny enough, you can never be rich enough, and your LDL can never be low enough. That's right. You agree with that statement? Absolutely. <clears throat> Before we go on to my summary, I'd just like to comment that uh, I, what a distinguished group of scientists we have on our panel here. Now, yesterday we gave a similar conference, as some of you may know, to other areas of the country. And being scientific like these fellows are, there was a debate over who was the best looking speaker on the panel. So we carefully structured, similar to the 4S trial, a scientific study where we measured the amount of time and makeup each of the fellows had. And yesterday, the clear winner was Dr. Roberts. Now somehow he felt he was the winner today, but what we did was we repeated that study, and no, no, none of the people know the answer. <laughs> but you now know that it, it, actually there was a tie tonight. Dr. Roberts and Dr. Simpson tied. However, I saw Dr. Simpson handing the makeup girl $10, so I don't know whether or not he was trying to, which just shows you the value of statistics. At any rate, with that scientific note, I'd like to continue and briefly summarize uh, what I think this data that you've heard means in your clinical practices. The data is rather compelling, and, and I can't help but think about when my partner uh, came to me one day to refer a patient to the Lipid Clinic and mentioned to me that he uh, had just had a patient who had a bypass operation about four to five years ago come in with an acute MI requiring now repeat intervention. In fact, he needed an angioplasty, and he noticed that his cholesterol was 260 and had been that way three or four years ago. And the patient said to him, Doctor, how come now you're anxious to treat my cholesterol and I don't recall anything being said about it when I came in. This sent a shiver down his spine as he looked at the data and remembered that the original NSEP guidelines came out in 1987 and the current National Cholesterol Education Program guidelines were published and distributed to all of us in 1993. He was very nervous about this, and appropriately so. I, I think based on the data that we now have, it would be very tough to defend not aggressively treating patients, particularly with secondary prevention. And I, I state that as a caution. I think you all need to develop a way in your practice to carefully manage these patients and follow them aggressively so that it's the ethical thing to do for the patient. Obviously, there's data based on it, and so that we can continue to be doctors in addition to having some role as a health care provider. With that said, I'd like to show you my first slide and show you just what the scope of the problem is. Uh, as you can see, the number of Americans who died just in one year in this country in 1988 of cardiovascular related diseases, which would include hearts and strokes, was 991,332. That number is staggering when you look at the number of soldiers who died in all the great wars. And in fact, the number of people who died in 1988 of cardiovascular disease is more than the sum total of all the people who died in all the great wars. So it's a huge problem, and if we simply reduce cardiovascular death by a small percentage, we'll save many, many lives. We now have the wherewithal to do that. 
When you take this one step further and you look at patients who have established coronary disease, the numbers are quite scary. P heart attack patients and patients with angina who also have elevated cholesterol, in other words, greater than 160 LDL, are 12 times more likely to die of heart disease than patients with desirable levels. And I think we can tell this to our patient who has coronary disease that we are trying to convince requires therapy, that we, he has 12-fold increase in death rate if his cholesterol is untreated. In addition, one-third of the heart attack survivors will have a second heart attack within five years, and that often results in disability or death. And the studies that we have available currently suggest that three out of four patients with established coronary disease who have high cholesterol are not being treated. So we've got a huge uh, project in front of us, which is to get these people treated. And I guess this brings up a lot of questions for the clinician. Why are we getting such remarkable reductions in clinical events? And, can, and where did the guidelines come from? Were the people who developed these National Cholesterol Education Guidelines just a bunch of uh, paper shufflers with slide rules in their pocket, or did they actually have uh, some science behind what they did? And I'd like to show you this data because I think it will make it more obvious to you that why what you're doing is correct when you aggressively treat dyslipidemia. I think the, the first question would be, how come we see such dramatic drafts in clinical events when we treat patients with dyslipidemia? And why do I ask that question? Because as an interventional cardiologist, I carefully looked at the so-called regression angiographic trials and looked at those patients who had coronary angiograms who, was, who had such reported dramatic results. And what was very disappointing to me was that we weren't seeing regression to the point where a 90% lesion was suddenly becoming a 30% lesion we were seeing 90% lesions go to 88% lesions. And a lot was made of this, a lot of excitement. We're cleaning up the arteries. That was very disappointing to me. So the question was, what happened to the patients? And what happened to the patients didn't make sense. They had dramatic reduction in risk of coronary events, even as early as the first 90 days. So what was going on with these patients? And what I'd like to do is show you what the current thinking is as to why we get such rapid benefits from lowering lipids in these patients. Now, if you look at my next slide, it's actually a slide that was shown earlier by Dr. Schwartz, which is the coronary event rate in the 4S trial. And you can see something very striking. If you look at the placebo group in white and the simvastatin group on top, uh, you see that the, the two curves start to separate at about six months. So there was actually a significant or a striking difference in the number of clinical events occurring in the diet group versus the group on drug as early as six months. Now, none of us believe that we're cleaning up arteries in six months. So something else must be happening. In the Pravastatin multinational trial, we saw a tenfold difference in clinical events in the first six months. And in one other trial, in the first 90 days, there were three times as many events in the group that was on, drug, uh, on diet therapy versus drugs. So what in the world is happening? And to understand that, I think we have to understand a little bit about atherosclerosis. And I realize it'll be difficult for you to read this slide uh, on your TV monitor, so I'm going to point out a few things to you. We think that the first thing that happens with atherosclerosis is that LDL, the lousy cholesterol, which should be lower, as opposed to HDL, the healthy cholesterol, which should be higher, uh, LDL seems to be the culprit. And LDL floats through the arteries, and luckily our arteries are lined by a very good protective uh, layer called endothelium. And the endothelium is excellent at repelling thrombus, as you know, it has some anticoagulant capabilities, and it also keeps fat from entering the deeper layers of the wall of the artery. However, under certain circumstances, this fat can get into the wall of the artery, and those circumstances would be several fold. But one would be, for example, an overwhelming amount of LDL, a patient with very high LDL cholesterol. Another would be a diabetic patient whose endothelium doesn't function properly, so it's much easier to get LDL into the wall of the artery. Third thing would be nicotine, which affects endothelial function and damages endothelium. And finally, hypertension, where at a branch point in a vessel, you're pounding away at the endothelium and destroying its ability to protect the artery. And when LDL enters the wall of the artery, what you get is something called a fatty streak. The top uh, panel in the slide shows some fat in the wall of the artery. And normally, fatty streaks don't kill anybody. You, can, you have fatty streaks at a very young age, and if that stays in that form, people don't have any problem. But something happens to the LDL cholesterol that leads to it becoming almost an antigen. In other words, it stimulates the body to overreact 
develop an immune response almost to this uh, uh, LDL in the wall of the artery. And it's that overreaction that leads to the devastating process of atherosclerosis. And what is it that happens to the LDL? It becomes oxidized. And that oxidized LDL stimulates monocytes in the bloodstream to come into the area and try and engulf the LDL. And they become macrophages, they eat up the LDL, but they send out many other chemical messengers that lead to other bad things happening to the wall of the artery. In other words, the development of an atherosclerotic plaque. In the second panel, you can see that what has happened is that the oxidized LDL has stimulated these little cells to come in, the uh, so-called foam cells, which are macrophages loaded with fat, and that they have stimulated fibroblasts to lay down scar tissue in the upper layer. So you have a fibrous plaque with scar tissue and a lot of fat underneath. Then finally, in the bottom panel, you have what brings me in at 2 in the morning, which is a crack in the endothelium leading to the blood being exposed to intima. And as you all know, exposure to intima by blood leads to rapid thrombosis. And it's the thrombus that f closes the final door in the lesion that occludes the lumen or that takes a patient with stable angina, for example, to unstable angina or an acute myocardial infarction. So with that in mind, I'd like you to keep in mind that these ruptured plaques that are loaded with fat are like boils almost, ready to burst. And when we look back at the trials of clinical event reduction and angiographic trials, we find out it wasn't the 90% lesions that went on to cause the infarcts in our, in our study patients. It was often the 20 or 30% lesions on the original angiogram, which were now closed when the patients returned with their acute MI. And the reason for that is that the fatty plaques may not be that tight, but when they rupture, they cause thrombosis of the lumen. And interestingly, when we lower LDL cholesterol, what we do is rapidly reduce the amount of fat within the plaque so that the plaque becomes smoother and more fibrous, so-called more stable, a stabilized plaque. And though it may not look much different on angiogram in terms of its narrowing of the lumen, it acts much differently and does not lead to acute events. So by stabilizing these plaques, we get dramatic reduction in clinical events, despite the fact that the angiograms don't look that strikingly different. With that in mind, I'll show you a histologic slide of uh, an autopsy specimen where you can see the fibrous cap in blue across the middle of the artery and the fatty area underneath that plaque. And you can see that the plaque has ruptured on the left side of the artery, right where the plaque hits the normal part of the vessel. This is a characteristic cracking spot. And the blood has bled into the plaque and, of course, thrombosed the lumen, which led to this patient's demise. So when we stabilize plaques, the first thing we do by lipid lowering is reduce the lipid content of the plaque. Secondly, we decrease propensity for plaque rupture because the plaque becomes more stable and fibrous. We probably have some reduction in thrombogenesis by virtue of lowering LDL. Then over the long term, we certainly halt the progression of atherosclerosis and probably in at least a third of the cases lead to some improvement in the lesions angiographically. So now, this leads us to what do we do with our patients. And we do have some very set goals. I think you've all uh, been told those. And I'd like to review briefly what the risks are and how to think of them in practice, and then try and explain to you where these uh, guidelines came from. Now, in this slide, I'd like to point out what the risk factors are. And keep in mind that age is a risk. But who is old is defined quite specifically. A male is old over age 45. A female is old over age 55 because of that magical drug that she has for prevention of atherosclerosis, estrogen. Women have heart attacks at the same rate as men, but they have them 10 years later when they pass menopause. So when you consider risk, a risk of age, you have to look at whether they're males or females, with 45 and 55 being the magic numbers. A family history of coronary disease is also a risk factor, but it has to be premature coronary disease, meaning a male in the family who has heart disease at under age 55 or a female under age 65, not a 90-year-old relative who died of a heart attack. So premature family history. Current cigarette smoking is a risk. Hypertension is a risk. Low HDL is also a risk factor, and a lot of people are confused on where HDL should fall into the treatment. We obviously would like to optimize HDL, but HDL should primarily be thought of as a risk factor, especially in light of not having very good HDL-raising drugs. So it is not fair to tell a patient that your HDL is 80, you'll never have a heart attack, don't worry about your cholesterol. The takeaway point is if you have a low HDL, that's an additional risk which should stimulate a change in your LDL goal based on the cholesterol education guidelines. If you have a high HDL, you can subtract one risk. 
But you can't tell the patient, don't worry, because your HDL is high. And I think that's a very important point. And of course, diabetes, many of us believe, should be two risk factors, because it's a very potent risk. And it certainly negates all the benefits of being a female and female diabetic patients. They have heart attacks at the same rate as their male counterparts uh, at any age. So with that in mind, what should the numbers be? And without belaboring that, I want you to remember three numbers, 160, 130, and 100. If your patient has less than two risk factors, uh, as outlined on the previous slide, the LDL goal is to be under 160. And if their LDL is over 190, their risk of heart disease strictly by virtue of having high cholesterol is high enough to warrant drug therapy with an attempt to get the LDL under 160. In your patients with higher risk, two or more risk factors, the LDL goal is under 130, and you should use drug therapy as needed to get them under 130. And finally, if they have definite atherosclerosis, whether it be in the coronaries, the carotids, or the peripheral vasculature, the LDL needs to be under 100. Now, where did these guys on the National Cholesterol Education Committee come up with these numbers? And who were these guys? And actually, I've uh, had the pleasure of meeting several people on this panel, and they are not yo-yos, as we might guess. These are excellent investigators who put a tremendous amount of thought into these guidelines, knowing that they would probably be utilized by all clinicians. So let me just show you some of the data that I think will make it clear where they come up with these numbers. In this slide, you can see mortality rates, and I don't expect you to copy this slide down, but I just want to show you some trends. Uh, what we're looking at is the death rate per thousand patients per year. And in the upper left-hand panel, you see that someone who has normal high, uh, normal blood pressure and who's a non-smoker and has a normal cholesterol has an average death rate of 1.6 per thousand per year. So we all have a death rate, if we're healthy, of about 1 in 500 per year. Now, if you just raise their cholesterol with an LDL over 160 and you look over to the right, you'll see that you quadruple your death rate to 6.4 per thousand per year, just by virtue of having high cholesterol. And that's scary, but not as scary as what I'm going to show you next. So I want you to remember that 1.6 number for the healthy patient. Now let's drop down to the patient with hypertension in the second column. He has raised blood pressure, but a normal cholesterol. He doubles his death rate to 3.7 just by having hypertension. But if you move to the right and look at what happens to him if he has hypertension plus high cholesterol, he has a tenfold increase in his death rate compared to the healthy individual. So adding high cholesterol to hypertension exponentially increases the risk. And if we look at the bottom panel, a smoker who's hypertensive with a normal cholesterol has 6.3 per thousand death rate, which is approximately four times the average. But if you give him high cholesterol and he's a smoking hypertensive, he increases his death rate almost 20-fold to 21 per thousand per year, or 1 in 50 death rate per year. And we're not talking heart attack rates, we're talking death rates. So when you have a smoking hypertensive patient with dyslipidemia, you should look, them, look at them and seriously say, I am extremely worried about you. Your chance of dying annually is approximately 20 times that of a patient without these risk factors. And we need to get to work and modify all modifiable risks in these patients. Now, what are the barriers to treatment? Obviously, we heard that one out of four patients is being treated, and three out of four with known coronary heart disease are not being treated. And if we could try and take a guess at why they're not, I think there's some obvious things that I'd like to point out on the next slide. The first thing is patient compliance. And about half the patients who get started on a lipid-lowering drug are on that drug at the end of one year. And there's probably several reasons why that is. One reason is that the patients have misconceptions about the safety of the drugs. We now know that the most effective drugs are also extremely safe. Uh, secondly, they have a physician, possibly, who does not emphasize to them how important therapy is. And it only takes one statement, such as, you know, I'm not sure this cholesterol business is really that important, to have the patient eating pizza on that evening. So I think we all have to support the importance of therapy. And there are some misconceptions about compliance, which is that the cost of the drug or that the smarter patients uh, will have a difference in compliance. And it's often been said that the patient's well-educated, they'll take their pills, or the cheaper drug, they will take more of. And the facts are that studies don't bear that out. The, most, the largest barriers to compliance are patients who, are the number of doses they have to take. So the fewer doses, the more likely they are to take it. And there really is no correlation or very little correlation with cost or the intellect of the patient. 
Now the second barrier to treatment is the so-called diet holding pattern where physicians will tell the patients don't eat eggs, don't eat meat, and we'll check you again in a year. And that is not dietary therapy. The patients don't get treated early enough in that sort of a situation. And we certainly would recommend that you quickly refer the patient to someone who can give appropriate dietary th treatment rather than blow it off, so to speak, and give them a long trial of diet, which we know is not nearly as effective as drug therapy. And then finally, the patient holding pattern of who is going to treat the patient. Uh, when a patient gets an angioplasty, the cardiologist never forgets to tell the primary care doctor he needs a treadmill in three months or uh, he needs to be on his aspirin and I need to see him in a year, but very rarely do we discuss who's going to treat the cholesterol problem. The patient also has dyslipidemia. Would you as a primary care doctor like to treat him or should we as the cardiologist treat him? And I think we need to establish that in every patient and possibly incorporate lipid treatment or lipid dyslipidemia uh, identification early in these patients uh, as outlined by the previous speakers. Finally, I'd like to just give you a couple of thoughts on how you might in your clinical practice uh, adjust your practice to have an organized way of treatment without spending all your time looking at cholesterol levels. And on the next slide I have a few suggestions. Number one would be to consider enlisting a nurse who's particularly interested and may even be more enthused about her work in your office to help organize your laboratory follow-up and patient education and maybe learn dietary counseling to do a job for you. Secondly, to refer to a dietitian with reckless abandon so that you get appropriate dietary therapy or if there's a lipid nurse in your area to use that resource. Thirdly, you need to have a computer database if possible to follow up these patients and see how well you're doing at treating them and also to allow uh, assessment of your outcomes. And this is readily available from the pharmaceutical companies who will give you in some cases a free computer pro software program. Finally, if you can develop printed educational tools to have in your office for the patients, it will save you time and be an excellent resource for them to read when they get home, uh, which is when they usually forget what the doctor told them. So in conclusion, I think there's a wealth of convincing clinical evidence that lowering cholesterol in high-risk individuals and particularly in patients with coronary disease is both beneficial in reducing not only cardiac events but all-cause mortality. Lipid lowering has been shown to be cost-effective. And I don't think we can afford not to treat. There isn't any debate anymore. High-risk patients with, uh, and patients with coronary disease must be treated. And it will be very hard to defend not treating them. And we'll be very comfortable that we're doing what's good for patients and that what's do good for econo the economy also. Thank you very much. Alan, while we're, um, people are getting ready to ask your questions, let me ask you uh, one. And before I say that, uh, well, I guess two things. One is, um, Ross mentioned earlier the need to draw blood in the emergency department. And I, th I think one of the barriers that um, sometimes people don't think about is that we don't get a cholesterol level in the hospital and then by the time the patient comes back to the doctor they've forgotten about it. Do you agree with the, need, the appropriateness of drawing bloods in the ED? Yes, I, and I think that debate has been primarily uh, led by the, the true point that cholesterol levels do tend to get lower after any acute illness. So that uh, the, the statement is that cholesterol levels are inactive, inaccurate when you're ill. And the facts are that the inaccuracy occurs after they come in, but the emergency room levels are actually quite accurate. And so uh, I think emergency room numbers are very good. And, and what we do in our outpatient cardiac cath patients is as routine pre-cath orders, we have a lipid profile, which is certainly accurate. The patient is fasting, et cetera. So you need to identify those patients early. Uh, Dr. Simpson mentioned getting it with the first CPK, but I would encourage you to to have some plan in your hospital. The, the other thing is you mentioned diabetes as a particularly potent risk factor and noted, uh, and, and, and f there are other reasons in diabetics why they get coronary disease besides just having high lipids. Uh, what can you tell us about the impact of lowering cholesterol in these diabetics who also have other factors contributing to their disease? Well, that's a tough question because diabetics are hard to study. Their sugars are frequently uh, moving up and down, so their lipids are moving up and down, particularly their triglycerides, and that makes them a, not a great candidate for studies. But what we do have is a subgroup of people in the 4S trial who were diabetic that were treated on simvastatin. And simvastatin has a modest effect on triglycerides, but it's primarily an LDL-lowering drug. And when you looked at those people who are diabetic in the trial, you found a 43% reduction in mortality in the diabetics. 
And when you looked at the non-diabetics, they had a 28% reduction in mortality. So there's actually greater benefit by simply lowering the LDL aggressively in the diabetics than there was in the non-diabetics. And that's intuitively obvious because they're the highest risk patients. But I think that made us all comfortable that LDL lowering in, in uh, diabetic patients does make an impact. And triglycerides can be adjusted very well with dietary modification and aggressive control of the sugars. So I think LDL still remains a primary goal and in a diabetic patient that should be attacked with great vigor. Okay, I, I understand our first caller is on the line from Honolulu. I wish I was there with you to take this question personally. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, would be anxious to hear your question. Green light in Honolulu, go ahead. With like the 4F study, did you notice that there was a difference if people were tested for this and if so was a, a percentage of occurrence of people with LPA? Did, did the LPA data from the 4S trial and what percentage of people had elevated LPA levels? Do we know the answer to that? I don't know the answer to that. No. You know, there have been some other studies where they looked at elevated LPA, and I think that's a very good point. Uh, certainly the FATS trial that was done by Greg Brown, they looked at the subgroup of that relatively small number of patients with high LPA. And uh, there, there's a fairly large incidence of elevated LPA in patients, and it's highly heritable. Probably about 15% of patients with premature infarctions have what's called familial LPA excess. That's easy. The question is, what do you do with it when you find it? And I, I think that there are two clues, though we don't know for sure. One was that in the FAT study, if you lowered the LDL cholesterol low enough, all the excess risk of having elevated LPA levels seemed to go away. And a second study looking at phoresis of LDL particles in patients with a, a severe genetic disorder called familial hypercholesterolemia showed that whether you phoresis off the LPA levels or you just lower the LDL, the benefits are similar. And it seems that lowering LDL further may be the way to go with patients with very high LPA levels. LPA is still a controversy. In my clinical practice, I tend, if they have a very high LPA, with 30 being the upper limits of normal, I tend to treat their LDL to 80. That's not based on science, but I, I, I'm concerned that lower LDL seems to be a good approach with those patients. Yeah. It, it wasn't measured in 4S, I know that. Um, but they do have the serum, so I guess if somebody's interested enough and can convince them, they might be able to go back and measure it. Okay. Next call from Irvine. Go ahead. Um, yes. Uh, Dr. Brown, the reason I'm calling is I'm a registered dietitian, and I really enjoyed your uh, program this evening. But, um, and I especially uh, appreciated the point you made about the physician um, saying to the patient, don't eat eggs, uh, and, and then they don't check them for a year. Uh, but my question to you, I have two questions. One is that um, are there, um, for example, with the 4S study, was there a dietary component, uh, you know, a, a well-designed dietary component with registered dietitians providing medical nutrition therapy frequently, you know, in terms of the number of visits? And was that data studied? And did you look at subgroups of patients who had uh, better compliance than other patients? And was there an effective behavior modification component to this dietary component? Well, the 4S trial definitely had a dietary limb, and the dietary limb was that uh, you had to, all patients had to be on eight weeks of aggressive dietary treatment, and at the end of that eight weeks, their lipids were rechecked, and they had to have high lipids despite an eight-week fairly aggressive dietary trial before they could enter into the study. Uh, and of course, the study was to look at the patients on diet versus patients on drugs. So there isn't a whole lot of data you can extract out from the diet group since they were the control group. I think we have lots of data that low-fat diet reduces risk of coronary disease. In fact, you can look at percent fat in the diet of most populations and simply by that number alone, without drawing any blood, predict the risk of mortality from heart disease. We also have some previous studies that showed that the patients at the same level of LDL even if LDL is below 100. If you divide them out to who did well with LDL below 100 and who didn't do so well, you found out that the major difference could be determined by the percent fat in the diet. And if they had less than 23% fat in the diet, they did much better, even at the same level of cholesterol. 
I think this is an important point when your patients say, Doctor, my cholesterol is perfect on my Zocor. Do I need to keep on following a low-fat diet? And the misconception by physicians and patients is don't worry about it. And that fact just isn't true. Diet is a necessary component. It may not be sufficient. That was the... Okay, next call is from San Jose. Go ahead, San Jose. Green light in San Jose, go ahead. Okay, we lost San Jose, we're going to Denver now. Yeah, Denver, go ahead. The question is to Dr. Roberts. Be aggressive in your uh, treatment of cholesterol levels, uh, both in people with heart disease or without heart disease. I'm talking about upper level of age. Oh. Um, when, how old does a person have to be before you do not uh, use uh, drug therapy? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it's always uh, uh, interested in me that there's no hesitancy in sending patients in their 70s and maybe in their 80s to angioplasty or bypass operation and yet to give a lipid lowering drug to somebody 75 or 80 is a, it seems to be a big deal. Um, I think the evidence is fairly good that it's that lipid lowering is effective in older people uh, as in uh, as it is of course in younger people uh, when my mother my mother uh, died last year at 91 now when she was 87 or 88 uh, she was quite vigorous uh, I, I don't think I would uh, have given her lipid lowering therapy but uh, had she needed it at 80 or 75, I would not have hesitated. It's an interesting problem. I think that that's always a debate. I've always asked the participate, participants in these conferences, have you ever bypassed a patient who's 80 years old? And invariably someone raises their hand and said, sure I have. And I asked them why did they do that? Well, they did it because this patient was young for their age. and. It seems ludicrous to me that you'd put someone on a heart and lung machine, bypass them, do a sternotomy at 80, and then tell them they're too old to be on lipid lowering therapy. Unless you really believe that there's something inherently different about body physiology between age 75 and 80. On the other hand, a bedridden elderly patient in a nursing home, you would neither bypass or treat for dyslipidemia. So uh, the data is unclear, but certainly the prevalence of death due to heart disease in the elderly patient is higher than in any other group, and so a small reduction in risk should translate into much fewer deaths. And I think this is where we're doctors and not healthcare providers. We try and weigh the benefits versus the risk and the expected survival of the individual patient. And I think when we're talking about people with pre-existing heart disease, the, the data really are quite good. That they're, um, the limits on the on 4S were, I think, I believe, 70 years of age, but there was really no significant difference in response by age. Older people responded just as well, and in the course of five-year study, you could get even if you get a year or two extension of life, that's a very cost-effective uh, thing in the elderly. So, in, at least in people with established heart disease, it's clearly worth treating. And then the question just comes: How far? That, when does it not become worth treating? Right. I think it's hard to put someone who has no heart disease at age 80 on an expensive and maybe potentially toxic therapy. So those are if if they have a lot of coexistent disease. But I would agree with Dr. Roberts and what you said before is if they're if they're young 80, if they're healthy 80, and they have a long life expectancy, um, we should be treating all the disease that that's appropriate to treat in those people. Excellent. I'd like to just make an announcement to the Los Angeles site. Uh, you will need to call an 800 number to reach us for questions. The number is 1-800-533-2786. So please call that number and remind everybody else to press your call buttons when you have a question. Okay, our next call question is from Seattle. Go ahead, Seattle. Hi. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> You're not Sorry. supposed to ask. Uh, there's two questions. One is, um, the first one is regarding the, oh, for, for Dr. Simpson and Alice, when you um, said that the, uh, we all know that cholesterol uh, seems lower uh, acutely uh, when, when someone is acutely ill, when you say you draw it in an emergency department, that will be closer to normal. I don't know if you have any data uh, for that. Uh, the second question is uh, for Dr. Uh, Roberts and Alice, 
on the note of, uh, of you can never be thinner um, and uh, enough and, and uh, the LDL lower enough. I wonder uh, what's your comments on the um, studies that published last year in the, the European studies on those patients with low uh, cholesterol, total cholesterol levels like uh, less than 160 that have a higher incidence of uh, suicide and, and, and depression. Do you want to take the first yeah, one, Ross? Mine, mine, mine's easier, so I'll do that. <laughs> yes, we do. The question is, do we have data to recommend drawing cholesterol in the emergency room in patients with acute infarction or unstable angina? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> and you'll hear it now. Basically, what we found in our institution was that um, managing patients by the traditional way, only about five to ten percent of patients with unstable angina or acute infarction had left the hospital with uh, effective treatment for their lipids. And six months later, they were still not effectively treated for their lipids with anti-lipid drugs. In contrast, when we did a randomized trial, or started a randomized trial, with comparing a usual care intervention, which meant just letting the doctors do what they seem to do naturally and best, but sometimes not best, compared to having the lipids drawn in the emergency room, we found better compliance by the physician with the guidelines as well as with the patient uh, four or six months later. Essentially, we substantially improved lipid management by taking a very simple intervention of drawing the lipid value. Now, there is a caution, and that caution is, is sort of similar to what Alan had mentioned earlier. If you wait, the lipid values will drop during the course of the hospitalization. So you have to be a little aware that the lipid values you see in the hospital may be a little bit lower. They're never higher. They're lower than the patient may normally have. But what that just simply means is that instead of seeing a lipid, an LDL of 160 or 150 or 145, you're seeing an LDL of 130, well within the treatment guideline plans. The second question is a good one, and that's actually a question that I think has been answered by the 4S trial. Uh, remember that it's very difficult to look at a study and draw a conclusion from that study when the question you're asking was not part of the design of the study. So the conclusion that patients who had very low uh, cholesterol levels in the previous large-scale trials seemed to have an increased risk of non-cardiac death, such as suicide, cancer, etc., uh, was very difficult to assess because those studies weren't designed to look at that. When the 4S investigators looked at 4S uh, and designed it, they, they figured out statistically how many patients would we have to look at for how long to answer that question, and the results were very gratifying, which is in this 4,444 patients at the end of five and a half years, there were no increases in non-cardiac death or non-cardiac morbidity as opposed in the treatment group versus the diet group. In fact, there were about three or four more patients in the diet group who had non-cardiac death than there were in the treatment group. So I think that answered the question with a high statistical power that there does not seem to be an increase in non-cardiac death in patients on treatment. So the question is why do people with under 160 in several trials seem to have an increased death rate? Well, that may be that they had illnesses prior to entering the trial, such as they may have had pre-existing cancer or pre-existing other problems that led to an in increase in death rate. The other thing that they did do, Alan, at 4S is they looked specifically at deaths from cancer and deaths from suicide and accidents. And again, they were um, almost identical between the two groups. So in addition to looking at non-cardiac deaths as an overall group, they also looked at specifically at those two um, conditions that had been suggested by retrospective analysis of previous studies. It may be also that um, the dr drugs have effects too and the statins appear to be uh, extremely safe. And I think it's um, when you look at unexpected outcomes in clinical trials, in addition to having a, a fair degree of skepticism because 